Well, today I'm going to start something new. Something I believe is going to add value to your life and equip you spiritually for the season we're going through. We're all in such an uncertain time and we hear that all the time. You don't need me to tell you that. There's barely a person on the planet right now that's not affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Whether it's getting sick or getting a reduced income or actually losing your job or even losing a loved one. So many people have moved backwards in terms of their standard of living. Where they were once able to get by every month, now they're battling sometimes even just to feed their pets. Others can no longer afford food for themselves. And more and more people have found themselves selling furniture and other things just to try and survive another week or two. There are even those now that are unable to afford nappies, formula for their babies, and are being forced to just somehow make a plan and get by. You know, and as if that's not hectic enough, on top of all the virus-related stuff, living, living in South Africa has its own unique challenges with ridiculously frequent cases of corruption, a government that is failing its people at all, so many turns, departments like health services and education and law enforcement, among many others, sadly, that are just hopelessly underfunded and completely mismanaged. And please, let me just say quickly, don't misunderstand me, though. Don't get me wrong. I love my country, but there's a lot that needs fixing. So we've got the uncertainty that the virus brings. We got the chaos that our country is in. And then, as if that's not enough on our shoulders, there's also our personal lives on top of those things with the everyday pressure of just family and working and studying and finances, health challenges and stuff like that. It's a lot. And here's the point. The result of living under all this uncertainty and chaos and pressure is that we so easily become fearful. And so for the next few weeks, my goal is to, by God's grace, preach faith and courage into our hearts as we see what God's word says about being fearless. And actually, you'll notice that the word is broken up and that is deliberate. The reason for that is that I'm not convinced we can ever really be fearless. Not this side of heaven anyway, but we absolutely can fear less. In fact, if I had a subtitle for this series, it would be, we can fear less tomorrow than we do today. And that's the goal of the series. Fearless is about finding courage from God to face those things in life that keep us from walking in all that God's created us to be. And so just a note as I get going, a lot of my thoughts and background for this series have come out of a book I'm reading, which is called Fearless. And it's written by a man named Max Licardo. Many of you might know him. He's an excellent Christian author and pastor. So if you're into reading and you want a great book on this subject, check out Fearless by Max Licardo. It's hard to get the physical version though. So if you want to read it and you want to get it, you'll have to settle for something like Kindle or something like that. But it's worth it. And if you love reading, go and do that. Being fearful. It's natural for us to fear things. Whether you're down to your last salary or your last possible solution or your last teaspoon of faith, when hard times come, fear moves in and your happiness moves out. It seems like the two don't live together very easily. We fear the future. We fear the mole on our back. We fear our financial investments and how they're doing. We often don't realize how fearful we've become until we're in a situation in which we no longer have to be fearful. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Years ago, Sars and I went to Holland to visit her best friend. On the way to the town she was living in, we had to catch a train or a bus, I can't quite remember, and we sat at the station waiting for them to fetch us on one of the benches. And you know how it is, your luggage is on either side. And for us, it was extremely close to us. We... 
We, we wanted to look around at all the cool stuff that was new in this country we hadn't been to, but we felt like we couldn't leave our bags for a second because we knew as soon as you turn your back, someone's going to run past. They're going to steal your bag from you. Not only that, but when anyone walked a little bit too close to us as we were sitting on that bench, we would kind of <clears throat> tuck the bags in a little closer under our arms. And actually when her friend arrived, when Sar's friend arrived to collect us from the station, she explained that, you know what, it doesn't really work like that here. No one will take things that don't belong to them. If you leave your wallet lying on that bench, someone will hand it in at the ticket office and they'll just call it over the intercom and you can go there. And so they, these guys would just leave their homes unlocked. They'd leave their cars unlocked. Sometimes, I mean, she said that they leave their, their keys in the car sometimes. That seems absolutely nuts to someone who comes from South Africa. We didn't realize how cautious and fearful we'd become. Constantly aware of possible theft or violence that could happen if you weren't watching, if you weren't careful. And so fear comes naturally to us. Maybe especially for those of us that live in South Africa. But living fearful is no way to live. Wise and aware, yes. But fearful, never. Listen to how Max Licardo puts it. And I'll quote straight from the book. He says this. Fear never wrote a symphony or a poem. Never negotiated a peace treaty or cured a disease. Fear never pulled a family out of poverty or a country out of bigotry. Fear never saved a marriage or a business. Courage did that. Faith did that. People who refused to consult or cower to their timidness did that. But fear itself? Fear herds us into a prison and then slams the doors. Wouldn't it be great to walk out? Sure, now you want to go read the book, don't you? It's such a good sentence that explains how, what fear does to us. It herds us into a narrow place and shuts the door. Now think about this for a moment. Imagine your life without anxiety and worry. Imagine that when you felt worried, or anxious about a situation in your life. Imagine your default reaction was faith, not fear. Imagine a day, just one single day, without a trace of the fear of failure, or the fear of rejection, or the fear of what might happen. It sounds like a dream or a fantasy, doesn't it? But maybe it is possible. Maybe it's possible that faith could be the first and the loudest voice we hear, not fear. I want to look at an event that Matthew and Mark in the Bible told, told us about. It's the story of Jesus calming the storm. And I want to pull out some truths that will minister faith and courage into your life from this story. So we're going to read from Matthew's account and it's found in chapter 8 of Matthew verse 23 to 27 says this, Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Lord, save us! We're going to drown! Jesus responded, Why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up rebuked the wind and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man? they asked. Even the winds and waves obey him. So it says, a fierce storm. Now Matthew chose his words carefully. The word he used was actually, if you look at the Greek, seismos. I wonder if that rings any bells in you. A fierce storm. Seismos rose on the lake. Now, you might have guessed what that word means or where, what words we get from that. Seismic, seismologist. It's words that have to do with earthquakes. That's how Matthew remembered this day. This was a huge storm that came. You know what? In his gospel, he only used that word three times. And the other two times was number one, when Jesus died. And there was an earthquake. And number two, when Jesus rose from the dead 
and the earth shook. It's amazing. It was when he defeated sin and when he defeated death. Apparently, Matthew put this storm into that kind of category. So it was big and it was scary. When it happened, there was sudden fear. How do we know that? Because the word suddenly is used. They were not expecting the storm. And, you know, here where we live in Crawford in the Eastern Cape, everyone's got their special way to know when a storm is coming. You know, some people say, well, it gets hot and then it rains. Okay. Other people say, well, a sudden cold spell in summer. <laughs> that definitely means rain. Okay. Other people say, ooh, the wind's blowing from that direction. That definitely means rain's coming. You know my special way to know when rain is due? It's when I'm getting wet in it. That for me is the most reliable way to know when rain is coming. Well, the storm in this story was not the kind of storm you could see rolling in through the mountains, coming towards you slowly, and you knew it was coming. No, it wasn't that kind of storm. Everything was calm and everything was clear. Then suddenly... It was chaos. Everything was January and February this year. And then suddenly, it was March. This story gives us a reality check that some Christians are still in denial about. If you sail with Jesus, you are going to get wet. Pastors can try to sugarcoat it, but Jesus never did. He told us straight out that here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. That's John 16, 33. Christians lose their jobs too. Christians contract COVID. Christians bury their children. Christians battle addiction. And Christians struggle with depression too. It's not the absence of storms that sets us apart. It's who we have with us in the storm that does. And that's Jesus. Now, you'd think the disciples would have been more chilled, quite frankly. I know it was a fierce storm and we just said it was enormous and massive and sudden that came out of nowhere. But this event happened literally right after Jesus performed a whole day's worth of incredible miracles. All in the same chapter in the story, chapter 8. And so if you read that, you'll see that Jesus starts off by touching a man with leprosy. And he completely heals him. Well, right after that, Jesus heals someone that's not even near him. Someone who was paralyzed and in incredible pain. And he just commands that man to be healed. And he was healed. Right after that, Jesus went in and he healed Peter's own mother-in-law of a fever. Just after that, Jesus uh, set free an entire crowd of people. Some who were possessed by demons and others that just needed serious physical healing. Then Jesus and his crew got into a boat and this happens. So you'd think after a day like that, if you had just witnessed all the stuff Jesus had done, all the miracles, you would have been able to trust that, hey, Jesus has got this. Jesus is in this. He's okay. He's going to sort this out as well. Well, that's what I'd like to believe I would have thought. But I guess we're all, we're all the hero of our own stories. If I was really honest, though, and I dug deep, I'm pretty sure that I would have panicked right alongside the disciples as well. If I was with them, waves crashing into the boat, I'm sure I would have forgotten all the miracles that Jesus did earlier that day, too. And I would have been completely scared and totally fearful. And actually, that's one of the things fear does. Fear makes us forget what Jesus has done and how good God is. Think about how true that is in your own life. I'm willing to bet that you've got stories, lots of personal stories of what God has done in your life. And the biggest of those for many of us is that he saved us. And we know that. But I'm sure, like me, you've got stories of a time that Maybe God healed you or a time that God miraculously provided for you when you needed it desperately or a time when God opened doors for you to find work when you had no idea what you were going to do. Or maybe it was a time that God gave you a solution that you could never have thought of on your own. The longer we walk with Jesus, the more of these stories we get. But no matter how wonderfully and miraculously God has come through for us, 
Fear makes us forget what Jesus has done and how good God is. So let me take a second here just to encourage you to do something. Write these stories of God's goodness down. I used to think that writing a diary was for girls. Come to think of it, I still do think that. But, you know, when men make a diary, we call it a journal. And that's much more manly. And so we journal, you diary. But whatever you call it, the point is this. Do it. Record those direction-changing words from God. Record that miraculous intervention that Jesus did on your behalf. Record that time that God lifted you out of the emotional clay you were in and set your feet on a solid rock. Record that time that God steered your marriage away from the rocks and into healthy space. In the Old Testament, when God did something big that changed the direction of everything, what his people would do is that they would build an altar at the place that it happened. That was their way of making a journal or a diary if they were girls. When Noah stepped out of the ark, he built an altar to remember what God had done. When Jacob had an encounter with God, he woke up and he built an altar to remember what God said. When the Israelites crossed the Jordan into the promised land, they built an altar to remember. And whenever they came across one of these altars that was scattered across the landscape, they would remember God's goodness to them. I personally have a certain diary, <laughs> I mean journal, that I physically write down these special times of God's goodness to me. And I promise you, they're a big comfort. Even years later, when I need to remember what Jesus has done and how good our God is. And we all need that because fear, fear makes us forget. Another thing fear does is fear paralyzes us. Fear stops us dead in our tracks. It immobilizes us. It paralyzes us and makes safety our highest priority in life. But here's the reality about safety. Nothing significant is ever accomplished by living a risk-free life. Love is risky. Generosity is risky. Dreaming is risky. And so people that are fearful shrink back. Instead of pushing forward into all God's called them to. And so let me encourage you today. Don't shrink back. Push forward. Jesus has a problem with us living fearful. I don't know if you know that. The one phrase he said more than any other. In fact, it's recorded 21 times in some form or other. And you've probably guessed it already. Was some form of this phrase. Don't be afraid. He said, so don't be afraid. You are worth much more than many sparrows. That's Matthew 10, 31. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. That's John 14, 1. He said, I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough. That's Matthew 6, 25. Don't be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't worry about your everyday life. Now, don't misunderstand me. Fear does serve a healthy purpose sometimes. It warns us of potential danger. Like if you hear a car coming as you're about to cross the road or if you smell smoke in your house. Well, fear can push you to do positive action as well so that you don't step into the road or you get out of the burning house. The problem comes when we adopt a posture of fear. When we allow anxiety and worry to dominate and define our lives. Fear robs us of our joy. It steals our peace and it leaves us paralyzed and insecure. And that is not what God wants for your life and my life. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 reminds us, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love and self-discipline. When I was very young, I had nightmares, I think almost every night. And I think it's fairly common to have nightmares. But the problem for me was that if I woke up in the middle of the night and everything was dark, I would lie in my bed paralyzed with fear. Every noise sounded so loud. Every shadow looked like 
an evil creature waiting to get me. When I looked into the blackness in my room, into a corner, it seemed to get even blacker. I remember being completely convinced that there was something under my bed. And if any small part of me, uh, whether it was a foot or a hand or an elbow, went over the edge of my bed, it would for sure be ripped off by whatever was under there. We never had bedside lights in those days. Thanks, mom and dad. <laughs> there was just the main bedroom light all the way by the door. And after a long, long time, I would build up my courage. And, well, actually, I'd probably be more desperate to go to the toilet than have the courage. But I would need to get up and I would run out of my room uh, to either my parents' bedroom or to my older brother's bedroom and they'd be sound asleep. How could they sleep at a time like this with creatures around like this? While I was terrified and afraid, they were sleeping. Sometimes I ended up sleeping in their bedroom and other times they would come back with me to my room where they'd bravely switch on the light and I couldn't believe how fearless they were. As they would look inside the cupboard, they would look under the bed and behind the curtains and make sure there was nothing there. Well, I wonder if God doesn't look at our storms in the same way. Maybe that explains why he asked the disciples a question that seemed so silly. If you remember that this boat is in a fierce storm and waves are breaking into it. In Matthew 8 verse 26, Jesus asked them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Well, I would have thought it was pretty obvious, what with the thunder, the lightning, and the gale force winds. But Jesus is like that dad who you wake up in the middle of the night because you're scared of something under the bed. Well, he doesn't seem scared at all. And he asks us, hey, why are you scared? Maybe Jesus gets our situation a lot more than we think he does. He's not asleep because he doesn't care. He's asleep because he knows that there's nothing he can't handle. These disciples were terrified. They genuinely thought that they would die in this boat in this storm. They were overwhelmed with fear. And you might be someone that feels like you're in, a, in that boat right now, in that storm right now. And this could be the end of you. I want to tell you that I know what it's like to feel absolutely alone in a desperate situation. You've got friends and family that care. But you feel like you can't reach out for help. There's a feeling like the walls are closing in around you. There's a fear that grips you and keeps you awake every night. The fear of having no more options left to try. Now this could just be for one person listening. But I want to tell you something. Jesus is with you. Jesus has not left your boat. Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. And if you hold on to him. With what little faith you have left, you will make it to the other side. My Bible teaches me in Romans 8.28, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose for them. And so hold on. Hold on to God no matter what you're going through right now. Remember this. The only reason those disciples made it to the other side that day was because they stayed inside the boat with Jesus. So don't you go jumping out the boat into the water and try and swim to shore in your own strength. Stay in the boat. Jesus has got this. Be encouraged. That's it for today. Really, there is so much more to say about this, but we'll get into some more of it next week. And please... Stick with us through this series because even if one or two of these messages aren't for exactly where you're at right now, God might put someone else on your heart that you can share this with that's going to find strength and courage to fear less. So let's pray together before we go, you know, our own separate ways. And please don't tune out now. Stick around and pray with us as a family. I firstly just want to pray for you if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling worried, scared. As I said in the beginning, there really are so many reasons why you could feel, feel, feel fearful. We've spoken to people in the last few weeks that have, yeah, that have lost their jobs, that are fearful about what the future looks like for them. We've been in contact with people that are selling possessions to survive. And they're fearful about what happens when there's nothing left to sell. 
We've heard from people who've lost someone close to them and they're fearful about what life is going to be like without that person. We're all in some sort of storm. And whether we want to admit it or not, storms make us fearful. But that doesn't mean they have to paralyze us. God has got plans for you. So remember what Jesus has done and the goodness of God. Remember those altars that you built when God came through for you. Stay the course. Hold on to Jesus. Stand on his word that he causes all things to work together for those that love him and are called by him. And you will make it to the other side. Come on, let's pray together. Father God, I thank you that we never need to despair. Lord, I thank you that your word says that even when we trip, we don't fall down. Father God, I thank you that you've got us, that you understand our situation deeply and intimately. Lord, I thank you that you care for us and I thank you that you are a good father that looks after us, that is there for his children. Father, we know and we declare right now that we are not alone in the boat, that you are in our boat, that you are with us, that you care for us. And Father, that if we can hold on to you, we know we will get to the other side. Lord, for those who are experiencing paralyzing or crippling fear about the future, about what they're going through, Lord, we pray that you would give them the peace that passes understanding, the peace that in spite of terrible circumstances, that their hearts would be still and quiet that they would have a confidence and a hope and a faith in you and in your plan. Jesus, give us peace. Give us strength and help us, Lord Jesus, to fear less. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, lastly, I want to pray with you today. If you've maybe listened to this message and there's one thing that's become crystal clear to you. Jesus is not in your boat at all. If you've never invited Jesus into your life as your personal Lord and Savior, I've got great news for you. That's your first step. That's your next step. And you can take it right now. And as I said earlier, having Jesus in your boat doesn't mean you don't go through storms, but it does mean that you don't go through them alone. Jesus loves you. Jesus gave up his life for you. And Jesus is offering you new life. If you know that God's calling you right now, please allow me just to lead you in a prayer of repentance and surrender. You can pray with me out loud or just where you're standing in your own heart. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you do care for me, that you love me. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place for my sin so that I could have new life with you. Father, won't you forgive, please forgive all my sins. Please wash me clean. Today, I give you my whole life. I surrender it all to you. And I turn away from that sinful way of living. And I turn towards the way of life that you've offered to me. Father, I give you my whole life today. Take it and make me new. In Jesus' name. Amen.